everybody. I want to welcome everybody to the lawn. Glad you're here. I want to make sure everybody in our cars can hear us. If you can hear us through us, 106.9, honk your horns. Yeah, I like the sound of that. We also want to welcome everybody watching by Facebook or on YouTube. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. We are so uh, happy to be able to worship in person out on the lawn. God's given us another great Sunday. All the way up to Wednesday is supposed to be 60% chance of rain today. But then on Wednesday, it dropped down to 20, and last night down to 10. So we like that. Like that a lot. So uh, we're so glad you're here. If you didn't get a bulletin, you can get one right over there as you came in. You're going to need it for your lyrics to sing. We want everybody to sing as loud as possible. We have not been able to sing together for six months, so we want to be able to do that this morning. So sing loud and proud uh, as uh, we worship this morning. We are so glad you're here. We are finishing our series this morning on the Book of the Covenant, and uh, I'm excited about what God has to say to us this morning. Let's go before the Lord in prayer as we begin our time of worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for another beautiful Sunday morning. Lord, we thank you for all those who have gathered here in the cars, on the lawn, that are watching at home on Facebook and on YouTube. Lord, we are together. Uh, through the Holy Spirit. And we have come to seek your face this morning. We want you to speak to us. We want you to uh, encourage us. We want you to challenge us that we might look more like Christ tomorrow than we do today. Lord, may our worship bring you glory and honor as we sing our songs to you, as we bring our tithes and our offerings, as we bring our hearts ready to be changed, ready to be transformed. May it all bring you glory and honor this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
morning, everybody. So glad to see all of y'all here on this beautiful Sunday. I'm very glad to see that it is not raining because I really wanted to be here, and I'm sure y'all did too. Uh, this morning's verse, verses, I'm sorry, is Deuteronomy 16, 9 through 12. You shall count seven weeks. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time the sickle was first put to the standing grain. There you shall keep, I'm sorry, then you shall keep the feast of the weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand. Which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your towns, the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow among you, at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make the name dwell there. You shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for allowing us to come together. Lord, we ask you to be with us in this beautiful service, Lord, that you prepared. Lord, be with Pastor Wayne as he preaches. Be with Terry as he leads worship for us. Lord, we ask you to be with all those out west being affected by the by the wildfires. We ask you to be with the people of Louisiana as they're getting ready for another hurricane. And Lord, we ask you to be with us as a country through these times of just strangeness. Lord God, we ask you to guide us, to bless us, and allow us to have an amazing service in your name. We worship you and praise you. Amen. If you feel like you need to be seated, be seated. If not, if you want to stand, because we're going to sing holy, holy, holy. A lot of people can't sit down and sing that. And uh, we understand completely uh, because we're talking about walking on holy ground. Jesus said, where two or three or more of you are, are, are gathered in my name, I am there with them. And so Jesus is here with us. Let's worship him. Oh 
passage this morning is Exodus 23, verses 10 through 19. If you want to turn there in your Bibles with me so you can read for yourself what God has to say to us this morning. Well, I'm glad to see that y'all don't behave too much differently outside than you do inside. Nobody's sitting right up front in the middle. Everybody's shoved as back as far as the wall as possible. Now, I know that many of you are uh, chasing the shade, and that is completely fine. Just kidding with you. Uh, and I give you permission during the service as the shade changes, you're welcome to move, chase the shade again if you like. I won't uh, get on you or anything, I promise. So feel free to chase the shade as we go. I uh, want you to think about this. Do you remember the time, the last time you broke out dancing in the middle of worship service? Maybe the funky chicken, the macarena, did the sprinkler? No? You didn't do that? Huh. We don't dance in our worship services, do we? We have a, and uh, especially us as mainstream uh, Protestant denominations, we kind of shy away from that. We focus a lot on honoring God and coming before God with humility um, and uh, uh, making sure that we come with reverence, and that's a good thing. But the problem is we have a hard time expressing our glee before God. We have a hard time celebrating before God. As a matter of fact, really the only time that we have permission as Southern Baptists to dance is when we are uh, uh, either square dancing or at a wedding. So we either need to instigate some more uh, square dancing. I know we got a lot of square dancers in our midst, or we need a lot more weddings, that's for sure. I love to dance. One of the things I love about going to the um, Victory Sports Mission trips is at the beginning of each morning, as they're warming up for sports camp, they call all the kids down out on to the gym floor and all the volunteers, and they play upbeat Christian music, and we dance. Probably for about 20 minutes or so, 15 to 20 minutes. And it is awesome to see all those kids, teenagers, and adults dancing before the Lord. And it is an act of worship. It's really, really cool. And one of the really cool things is that those kids who don't have a lot of uh, exposure to God associate that glee, associate that joy in dancing with the Lord, which is really, really cool. We have a tendency to have a hard time to celebrate us Christians today. We can uh, deal with all kinds of other emotions, but we have a harder time dealing with celebrating. And so maybe we can learn something from the Israelites and God as he speaks to them about celebrating in the book of the covenant. And so from very early on, God was quite clear that there was to be celebrating in honor of all that God had done for his people. They were to rest and celebrate once a week on the Sabbath. They were to have a year of jubilee every seventh year. And they were to hold three festivals during the year. A festival of unleavened bread, the festival of the harvest, and the festival of the end gathering. Three times when God proved God's loyalty to Israel during the events of Exodus. And at these festivals, Israel was to bring their best of their offerings, their first fruits, to thank and praise God. It was to be a celebration. And I imagine that these celebrations were grand affairs. After all, they're celebrating the Exodus. They're celebrating God's people being set free after 430 years of slavery. God set free an entire nation from the most powerful empire on the earth at the time. God doesn't do that all the time, does he? But he did it then, and he wanted them to to celebrate it. Now, if you take a look at the Jewish calendar, you'll find out that they have several, all kinds of festivals that go throughout the year. They celebrate a lot. Not only that, but I believe that God gave them these festivals because they had earned some time to relax and celebrate. If you'd been in slavery working seven days a week for 430 years, you'd earn some time to rest, would you not? And what a better way to celebrate and to rest than to celebrate the one who makes celebrating possible. 
the one who makes rest possible. And this is what Exodus 23, 9, 10 through 19 is all about. Let's see if we can see the God of celebrations in this passage. We're going to start with verses 10 through 12. For six years you shall sow the land and gather in its yield. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people might eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. You shall do likewise with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. Six days you should do all your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey might have rest, and the son of your servant woman and the alien may be refreshed. Here we see instructions to celebrate the Sabbath. Here in the book of the covenant, God is laying out a roadmap of how he wants them to live, how he wants them to interact as they take possession of the land of Canaan. And in these instructions is this ab instruction to observe and celebrate the Sabbath. Not only that, but they're to celebrate a year of Sabbath on the seventh year. Now the temptation for the children of Israel would be to go into the promised land and since they've known, known nothing but working for so long, since they've known nothing but being nomads, once they own their own property, I am sure that they were eager to field the land, to uh, work the land. And they would probably, if left on their own, would have worked the land seven days a week. But God wanted them to show restraint and get rest for themselves for their land, for their livestock. And if they did that, in the end, it would bring them a greater harvest. But I want you to imagine the faith it would take to let your land rest for an entire year. Imagine if you were a farmer. We got a few farmers in here. Mr. Charles is over there. And uh, we got a few others. But imagine coming to that seventh year and it come time to plant, to till the land, and you don't do it. It comes time to put the seed in the ground. And you don't do it. The rains come. And you see the rain making the ground fertile. But you don't have seed in the ground. Could you imagine watching the fields grow over with weeds and grass and other things other than what you've planted? Can you imagine coming to harvest time and there's nothing to harvest? This would take incredible faith. It would take incredible trust in the Lord that he would provide for them for that year. Or he'd provide for them for the other six years so they had enough to eat during the seventh year. The Sabbath is an act of faith. And the consequences of breaking the Sabbath day were harsh. God wanted his people to celebrate so much that he promised punishments for those who refused to celebrate the Sabbath. Consider Exodus 31, 14 through 15. Just 10 more chapters ahead, or about 8 chapters ahead. It says, You shall keep the Sabbath, because it is holy for you. Every, everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Do you think God's serious about the Sabbath? Would you say we're as serious about the Sabbath as God is? God who designed earth and made us knows how we work best. And he knew that not only the land would need rest because he made it, but he knows we need rest because he made us and he built us with the need for rest and the need to be rejuvenated. Now the religious leaders turned these laws and uh, made uh, added to them and added all kinds of other laws to protect the Sabbath day. How many steps you could take on the Sabbath. What you could cook on the Sabbath. If you could help somebody who is in need on the Sabbath. All kinds of rules. If you remember when Jesus came along they even got on him and his disciples. I think that's funny. Those who spent their life studying God chastised God for breaking the Sabbath. <laughs> but it was because they had all these added on laws that had made the Sabbath a legalistic thing. 
And listen what he says in Mark 2, 27. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. I don't know if you ever took time to consider Jesus' statement here, but listen on why God made the Sabbath. He made it for man. He knew that man needed one day a week to rest, refocus himself and his priorities. A sermon on rest is needed in our time. It's timely in our society today, is it not? We like things now. <laughs> we like to keep on a fast pace. We like our food heated up in a microwave in 30 seconds or two minutes. If it's more than two minutes, I start getting antsy. I ain't going to buy that dish again. It takes more than two minutes to heat up. We go through fast food restaurants. We go through the fast lane. Have you ever uh, gone through the fast food line? They tell you, oh, it's going to be about two minutes on your french fries. My eye starts twitching. I don't know about you, but we can't even wait another two minutes for our french fries to be cooked. It is our mentality of always being rushed and it even spills over into our spiritual life. Did you know that in seminary they told me, they said, if you don't preach your sermon in 20 minutes, you're going to lose everybody. And so I fight against that. And uh, I try to be as succinct as possible. I try not to go on long. But that's where we've come to, where our spiritual attention span has only grown or has been shrunken down to 20 minutes. Do you start getting antsy when the service goes past 12 o'clock? Maybe you got something in the... In the, in the oven or something in the crock pot or thinking about everybody coming over that day. That's because we've always got to move on to the next thing. We've always got something we've got to do. And it's even shrunken our ability to sit under the Word of God. Think about this. Some of the greatest mistakes and accidents that have happened in history were a result of people being overly stressed and tired. The Exxon Valdez... Chernobyl, Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania, all happened in the middle of the night. When the Vincensus shot down the Iranian Airbus, killing 290 people, the fatigue stressed operators on the carrier misinterpreted radi radar data. In the Challenger space shuttle disaster, key NASA officials made the ill-fated decision to go ahead with the launch after working 20 hours straight and only getting two to three hours sleep the night before. God knows we need rest as humans. We need time to reflect and spend time focusing on Him as a family. The Sabbath is a great gift of God, but it's not just for us, it's for those around us as well. It's for the land, for the livestock. Verse 11 says that the poor were to have access to the fruit that was being produced on the uncultivated land during the Sabbath year. So not only were they to rest on the seventh day, but they were to let their land rest on the seventh year. God understands how the earth works better than man does. And by allowing the land to rest, the soil was going to get the nutrients it needed to be replenished, and the harvest after the Sabbath was to be even much better than if they hadn't let it rest. But not only that, but it also gave opportunity for the poor to be taken care of. It gave opportunity for the oxen and their, their livestock to be taken care of. We should honor and have the opportunity to celebrate the Sabbath. Verse 13. Pay attention to all that I have said to you and make no mention of the names of other gods, nor let it be heard on your lips. God, while he's talking about celebration, says, I don't want you to celebrate other gods. See, the pagan people around Israel, all around them, would be celebrating holidays as well. They would be celebrating gods of the harvest and gods of the land and gods of the weather. And God says, I don't want you to have anything to do with those gods. I don't even want you to mention them on your lips. You need to remember, you need to know that it is Yahweh that is God of the harvest. It is Yahweh that is God of the weather. It is Yahweh that is God of the fields and of the grains. Verse 14 through 18. 
Three times in the year you shall keep a feast to me. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread, as I commanded you, and you shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the month of Abib. Abib and in it you, for in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty-handed. You shall keep the feast of the harvest, of the first fruits of your labor, of what you sow in the field. You shall keep the feast of the ingathering at the end of the year, when you gather it from the field of the fruit of your labor. Three times of the year you shall all your males appear before the Lord God. You shall not offer a blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened, or let the fat of my feast remain until the morning. Here we see we're to celebrate God's provision. He does this by giving them three different feasts to celebrate. And the first feast is the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Verses 14 15 describes that. The Feast of Unleavened Bread started the Jewish year. God, if you remember, when he set them free from Egypt, he gave them instructions for the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. For seven days they weren't to eat any bread with leaven in it. Leaven represented sin. And leaven spreads throughout bread. And so they knew that sin spread throughout their community. And so for seven days, they would be set apart. They would be holy, without sin. Leaven was the symbol of sin. But God, when he took them out of Egypt, he set this up. He gave them instructions for how they were to celebrate it, for the meal that they were supposed to have, and how they were to dress, and all that. And so they would continue to celebrate that year after year after year, because it was when they were set free from Egypt. This is their biggest celebration of the year, kind of like our Christmas. You know how everything, we always look forward to Christmas. It's the biggest holiday for us. We really get excited about it. They felt the same way about the festival of unleavened bread. Of course, it was the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread that Jesus and his disciples were celebrating in the upper room the day before he was crucified. Verse 16 tells us about the Feast of the Harvest. This was seven weeks after the festival of unleavened bread. Uh, Paul read about this feast uh, in the scripture that he read earlier. He would be um, it would celebrate the harvesting of grains and wheat. It would be at the beginning of the harvest season. It was also during this time that the Jewish people celebrate the giving of the law and the Ten Commandments because it was this time of year when Moses went up on the mountain and received the law from God. Then in verse 16 and 17, we see the third feast, the Feast of the Ingathering. This is also called Sukkot, also called the Feast of the Tabernacles or Festival of Booths. And this takes place late fall. It is in a joyous celebration of harvest, a time to remember Israel's wandering in Sinai uh, desert before they entered the Promised Land. The festival takes place at the final harvest of the year, celebrating the harvest of the grape orchards, the gardens. It also became known as the Festival of Booths or Tents. Even today, those that celebrate this, there are many Jews that will celebrate it, and they'll, they'll build a little tent or a makeshift booth or tent wherever they gather, whether it be in their backyard, uh, sometimes wherever in their community center. They'll set that up, and they will celebrate that, and it helps remind them of when they were nomads wandering the desert for 40 years, and so living in tents. Now these are called the three pilgrim feasts, meaning all Jews, at least the men of the family, would travel to where the temple was, celebrate these feasts, and give their offerings and their first fruits. Why did God set these up? God, out of his great wisdom, set up these festivals amongst the Jews for several reasons. First, to perpetuate the memory of these great events and the wonders that he brought for the people. For example, the Sabbath brought the remembrance of creation of the world. So every time we celebrate the Sabbath, or any time the Jewish people celebrate the Sabbath, it's a reminder that who created the world around us, who created everything that we get to enjoy? It's Jesus. It's our Heavenly Father, hey, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit who created everything that we enjoy. But it also um, is a, it's a way to remember. I don't know if you were able to watch on Friday the uh, memorial services for 9-11 the 
and ticking through each of those events, that moment of silence from when all those terrible events happened on 9-11. And you're able to relive what took place. And that same gut-wrenching turn in my stomach came every time, all morning long, as we remembered But it keeps that memory alive. It's a reminder of what took place. Well, this isn't a somber thing that God is having them remember. It's a joyous thing. And so it brings joy. And as they celebrated, they were reminded what God did for them. He sets up festivals so we might remember what God did. Second, it helps keep them faithful to the religion by appropriate ceremonies. Each of the festivals would have different ceremonies that would take place and they would allow them to work out their faith. When we are involved in worship, when we're involved in ceremonies, uh, it allows us to work out physically our faith. That is one of the important reasons. It's why the, our worship is so important in gathering together with God's believers because it allows us to physically, our faith is something that is unseen, is it not? But when we can worship and join together with other believers and sing and bring our offerings and read God's word together and serve together and teach together, it is a working out, a very practical way to work out our faith. The third reason he gave them the festivals was to schedule lawful pleasures and necessary rest. God is not a great killjoy. He wants us to enjoy life. And so he even set up these festivals so they could be about lawful or uh, righteous fun <laughs> and activities. God wants us wants that for us. He wants us to celebrate. He want, doesn't want us to sin in our celebrating. You don't have to go far into the world or into our culture that celebrating means sinning. <laughs> but God is the author of partying. <laughs> He set up these celebrations from the very beginning. He wants us to have a good time. He wants us to enjoy life. And so he set up these festivals so we could celebrate in a righteous way. Four, to give them instruction. For when they uh, gathered for these religious assemblies, the law of God was always read. The pertinent scriptures were always read. Much like when we gather for the Christmas Eve service, we always read the, the birth story in Luke. We always have one of our, teen, one of our uh, boys in our church do that, our girls. And just like when we uh, have our Good Friday service or Monday, Thursday service, we read those passages about the upper room. The same thing was for them as well. It instructed them about the scriptures. Then fifth, these festivals consolidated their social union by renewing acquaintances. They would get to see people. It was like a family reunion. Imagine your family is 12 tribes. <laughs> lots and lots of people. Thousands and thousands of people. And so it was every time they had a festival, it was like a great family reunion. They realized that they weren't to live out their faith by themselves. God wanted them to stay connected to one another. This is what being part of the family of God is about. Being connected to one another, having those connections, having those family ties, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we do not gather together, those ties become weakened. God doesn't want that. He wants us to have strong ties. And so these festivals allowed that to happen. You see, God still calls us to faithfully coming in fellowship and to serve him on an ongoing basis. God calls us to the privilege and honor to celebrate and remember God's faithfulness and giving of our first fruits. Last verse, verse 19. The best of your first fruits on your ground shall you bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. That's a strange instruction, is it not? How many of you all are boiling your goats, your kids, in uh, its mother's milk? Anybody? Nobody? What's wrong with you people? Actually, you're following the law. That's good. 
Here is an admonition to not celebrate superstition. To not celebrate superstition. He says, do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. This was a pagan religious ceremony done to promote fertility. And God wanted his people to have nothing to do with this pagan practice. And Canaan, the practice of doing so, was superstition. The act of boiling a kid in its mother's milk was a fertility rite. In the promised land, there would be all kinds of other superstitious beliefs. But this one command becomes representative of many superstitious practices in the new land. This command of God becomes a general principle for the people to abide by. Do not be superstitious. God was not interested in forming for himself a people whose lives were formed and instructed by superstitions or crazy ideas. God wanted a people who would be obedient to his command rather than people who put their trust in false notions. God wanted a people to respond to what he said rather than the sayings of another religious system. And the people of God are to be focused as well. A Christian has to be focused. We have superstitions today, don't we? Well, you better not walk under that ladder. Oh, broke that mirror, you're going to have seven years of bad luck. What are some other superstitions you might have? Anybody know of any? Call them out. Don't step on a crack, breaking your mother's back. There it is, right there. Call a black cat, that's right. Yeah, these are all superstitions. We do not have to worry about mojo or cosmic karma or astrology and what it's going to do for us today. Because we don't worship the stars. We don't worship karma. We worship the creator of the stars. We don't need karma because we have a direct line to the creator of the universe. And we should rely on that faith. And that is what God has called us to do. So we see these passages, and we see a God who loves celebrations. He loves the Sabbath, and he wants us to celebrate it with him. He loves it when we rest. He loves and wants to give us the opportunity to celebrate his goodness. Did you know the Jewish community celebrates a total of seven festivals given by God throughout the Old Testament? They celebrate a lot. We would do better to celebrate a little more often. We would do better to celebrate all the good that God has given us. Now we have the systems to do that, but we don't kind of realize that God gave them to us for that. Did you know that we as Christians have 52 days set aside every year to celebrate God and his goodness? 52 days to bring our first fruits. 52 days to remember God's goodness. 52 days to celebrate the family of God that we've been given. You've been given 52 Sundays as gifts of God intended for you. A day of rest, a day to focus on Him, a day to give our first, first fruits back to Him, and a day to celebrate. But we also have other holidays. We have Easter. Easter is the fulfillment of the Passover celebration. So we, in, in a way, celebrate that festival. Christmas, of course, we're celebrating the coming of the king. And so if we, folk, we celebrate Christmas with the right emphasis, with the focus being on Jesus being given to us at Christmas, we're celebrating our religious holiday. And of course, Thanksgiving is a combination of the festival of the harvest and the festival of the end gathering. Uh, I think uh, Thanksgiving is one of the last Christian holidays that has not been uh, train wrecked or distorted by society. If in order for you to give thanks, you have to be give thanks to somebody. <laughs> so if you're giving thanks, you're giving thanks to God. You're acknowledging that there's somebody to give thanks to. But my point is, not how many holidays you celebrate. The point is God has called us to focus on Him. He's called us to give our best and celebrate His goodness and mercy to us. And we have an opportunity to do that every Sunday. How do you celebrate Him? I want to ask you a few questions. And I want you to think about these questions. First, is Sunday just another day of work for you? Or is it a day set aside for God? 
Is heading to church and studying God's word and worshiping him a drag? Something you just have to do? Or is it something you celebrate? Something you look forward to? Is bringing your tithes and offerings something you have to do? Or is it something that your family celebrates? Is the time you spend with other Christians a celebration or something you endure? Your answers to those questions give an insight to your relationship with God. You see, the outflow of a love relationship with God is celebration, not obligation, not something I have to do. Now, you don't have to dance and worship to celebrate God. Maybe you could actually clap. Maybe you could sway a little bit as you sing one of those upbeat songs. There's nothing wrong with that. But may we use the opportunities God has given us to celebrate who he is. May we be able to express that joy. I encourage you one day, if you have opportunity, go on Victory Sports Mission Trip and experience 500 kids, teenagers, and adults all dancing to the Lord at the same time. It's really, really cool. Although we can celebrate God by observing the Sabbath through our faithful gathering with God's people, through thanksgiving in our hearts, through bringing our tithes and our offerings with joy, through celebrating God's faithfulness to us, and by giving ourselves permission to rest. It is my prayer that your life will be a celebration of the God of celebrations. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we have so much to be thankful for. We have, our relationship with you produces joy. And sometimes we have a hard time celebrating. We uh, get caught up in the routine of life and it infringes on our ability to celebrate you. But you long for us to celebrate you. You long for us to revel in the joy that you've given us. And we may not celebrate all these Jewish festivals, but in a way, shape, or form, uh, we are called to celebrate you, as I said, 52 Sundays a year. And through the holidays that celebrate what you've done for us. The Lord, every day can be a celebration to you. When we focus on your goodness, when we bring our very best before you, when we celebrate the family of God that you've placed around us. May we at Flint Hill Baptist Church be a people who celebrate the God of celebrations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
want to encourage you to take your worship guide home with you this afternoon over lunch. There are discussion questions to talk about what we talked about today and what that means for you and your family and how you could celebrate God. So use that. This is the month that we celebrate our Janie Chapman offering in missions in South Carolina. And I'm not able to show you a video of some of the things that God's doing in South Carolina, but I am posting those on my Monday check-in. Uh, I did that on Tuesday this past week, so if you missed it, you can go to Tuesday and check out that video. Uh, but I'll be posting tomorrow as well, the second video, uh, showing w what our monies and our partnership with Southern Baptist Churches in South Carolina is able to do. And it's very, very cool. So uh, the, first thi the three things that you can do when you're confronted with missions is first, pray. In your worship guide today, you've received a prayer guide for uh, the Janie Chapman offering. And so I encourage you to read through and use these. One, There's one for eight days. So whether you start today or tomorrow, you'll still go over a week. Um, but pray for each of these missionaries. Pray for each of these ministries. What is really cool is day one is about a ministry in Rock Hill. And day two is about my good friend, Mr. Shannon Brown, who I pray with on a monthly basis. We get together and pray for each other and share about our ministries. Uh, he's right over here in Indian Land on the 521 corridor trying to start a church. So it's a, real, a really personal and close, at least those first two Sundays to us and what we're doing here in uh, York County, which is pretty cool. So use that. Pray. Second thing you can do is give. Uh, all month we'll take your Janie Chapman offerings. Pray about what you might give. And just give with your regular tithes and offerings. You can put it in a separate envelope or uh, put it as long as it's marked on the check. If you're writing a check, uh, you can uh, mark it on there. You can give online uh, by using our webpage. And there's a little place you can write in the memo uh, about your gift, what you'd like to give. But we will be taking those tithes. We'll be taking that special offering all month of September. So please pray about what you will give. And then last is to go. And uh, today we've been collecting school supplies for Sugar Creek Elementary. And so you can help be a blessing as we try to bless Sugar Creek Elementary. If you forgot yours or you're like, oops, it's too late, I'm sure Miss Terry will take some late, even though she's trying to get that all together. But you can communicate with her and get that to her if you want to bring it by the church office this week. So, But this is the last day we'll be uh, drawing attention to that. Next week, we're starting a new series called World Changers, and uh, we're going to talk about being world changers in our own neighborhood, so you will have opportunity to go in response to missions next week. I'm going to give you a very personal and very uh, uh, some way for you to be about missions in your own neighborhood next week. So pray, give, and go. We'll let you know that youth are going to start meeting in person outside starting next Sunday night at 6 o'clock. And uh, so that information is in your bulletin as well. But if you have a teenager or are a teenager, make plans for that next Sunday night. We've been given a gift. Uh, we have some of our daily breads, which are devotional guides for September, October, and November. And they are over here uh, in front of the uh, offering box. And so feel free to pick one up for you or your family. Those are first come, first serve. But it looks like we should have enough for almost everybody. So make sure you pick up one of those on your way out so you can keep up with your daily quiet time. These are great resources. That's all I have for you. Pray for good weather once again next week. And again, if it looks like it's going to be rainy on Sunday, we'll let you know on Saturday afternoon. Thank you for being here today. And uh, let me close us in a word of prayer, and then Terry and the praise team will close us out. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, today. We thank you for opportunity to celebrate who you are. May we be a people who celebrate the God of celebrations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.